Whenever someone dies by suicide, it affects everyone around them. Family, friends, their clubs, their schools, all are left with the emptiness and the questions that they now have to come to terms with. How do we support people going through that process? I'm Chris Plummeridge, and I'm sitting in the offices of Jesuit Social Services in Brunswick in Northern Melbourne to chat with two people who play a key role in helping both individuals and communities understand the grief and the loss they might feel when someone dies by suicide. We chat with Sean Walsh, who oversees JSS's Standby Support After Suicide, and his colleague Louise Flynn, who oversees Standby Support After Suicide and its sister program, which is just called Support After Suicide. We chat about what the bereavement process is like for someone grieving the loss of a close one who has died by suicide, about what you can do if grief affects someone close to you, and why good bereavement support can play a key role in suicide prevention. Standby Support After Suicide program has been running for about 20 years, and it's a program that is designed to support those who have been bereaved by suicide in, in a kind of intervention that is around assessing need, looking at what some next steps may be for people, you know, acknowledging the, the shock and the trauma that people experience when they've lost someone to suicide. And we follow up as well. So it's not just a kind of quick engagement with people just to kind of find out what's, what, what they need and where they go to next. But it's also checking in with people. And we do that. We have a what we call initial support session with people. So we will endeavour to maybe go to their homes, you know, sit with them, explore with them what they're experiencing, what that means for them, what are their immediate needs. Most of our work is done face-to-face, but we certainly are delivering over-the-phone support and support via Zoom as well. The other aspect of that is education for the community as well. So it started as a program that filled a gap in a a community in Queensland where there'd been a, a youth suicide and then followed by other youth suicides as well. And the community came together to kind of determine, you know, what can we do to prevent this occurring again? Or or if it does occur again, what kind of support can we put in there to assist people to to kind of process this this trauma and this shock? And um, it grew from there, basically. But always a driver for standby support after suicide has been the community resilience. So building up community resilience through education, through uh, workshops, through getting communities together to identify who in that community can be can be influential and supportive when a suicide occurs. Louise, I might move to you next. Can you explain a little bit more about what your role is with JSS and what your role is in Support After Suicide? Support After Suicide provides counselling and group support to people who've lost someone to suicide. So it's a different way of supporting and engaging with people who've lost someone to suicide. So it's great for us to have both these programs work alongside each other. It's a very caring response and it's also very comprehensive. What we know is that over time, what someone might need in the first days and weeks is going to be different to what someone might need six months or a year or 18 months down the track. And with these two programs working side by side, we're able to really provide something that's very comprehensive and compassionate and can respond to what people tell us that they need. The effects of having lost someone to suicide might almost seem fairly obvious, but I would imagine that the needs that people actually go through are actually pretty complex. Can you explain what these people who have lost someone to suicide might be facing and some of the things that they might need as they go through that process? So what we're finding initially is that it's just a shock you know, it's a shock and the trauma of the experience. It's not even grief yet, you know, or even thinking of how do we process that. It's just how, how do I kind of manage this overwhelm I'm experiencing at the moment? I've just lost someone I've loved in a horrific way. And how, you know, how do I process that? How, how do I even start to make some sense of that? And then you've got the coroner coming in, you've got the police coming in, you know, so there's lots of tasks to do lots of practical things to do you've got you know neighbors friends family coming in it it feels chaotic i think initially i often talk about being um, the calm in the midst of the storm 
you know, just being that rock that can calmly come in, sit with people, facilitate them talking about what they're experiencing, what they feel they need to talk about or what they need to, to kind of just get off their chest or, you know, what are they sitting with? And just to know that someone is there who can do that with them and for them. Whereas, you know, family members might come in, friends might, but, but don't have the language, perhaps, you know, don't know what to say exactly, or, or feel that they have to walk on eggshells around people and not explore what, what's going on. Uh, and we find that can be really useful for people in those initial stages and just helps them to kind of stabilise, I guess, a little bit. You know, it doesn't <laughs> it doesn't take away, you know, what they're experiencing, the, the pain and the suffering is still there. But, you know, just, just having someone else to hold them in that place and space, I think, can be really, really useful sometimes. Well, I think also part of that, the initial shock that Sean's talking about is that sense of people can't believe that someone they love actually ended their own life. So it's that terrible sort of experience of how could this possibly have happened in our lives, in our family? And people can be thinking, what does this mean about me? Does it mean something about me or our family that this happened in our family? So that can be part of that. And people will often have quite a deep sense of guilt and perhaps a sense of responsibility for what's happened, or they'll be worried or even quite frightened that perhaps it was something that they did or didn't do or said or didn't say that might have led to this. There'll be a tendency to look for an explanation and often people will look to themselves and feel like maybe they didn't love enough or or something. So that's that's part of the sort of agony, really, I think, of losing someone to suicide that can be a bit different to other losses. And I think that can be very acute initially, but those some of those questions actually persist for quite a long period of time. For many people, losing someone to suicide, it takes quite a lengthy period of recovery. So standby stays in touch with people for two years and um, the counselling program and group program certainly is available to people for quite a long time after. I want to pick up on one thing that you said first, Sean, which was that while people are going through what is invariably a really terrible loss and a really uh, this whirlwind of emotions and trying to come to terms with what happened, they're also in this point where they need to do practical things and and do things that, you know, legally and quite complicated and quite often things that are outside people's normal remit of things that they do day to day. And they're suddenly having to deal with not only all this grief, but having to deal with all the practical things and then you've got also the people who are coming in trying to help whether there are the family members and all that sort of stuff who it might not necessarily be in their wheelhouse either to have to deal with the emotions and the grief and all that sort of stuff I guess that feeds into people's kind of fear of walking on eggshell. What are some of the things that people have to contend with while they're supporting somebody else through their bereavement? Yeah, look, I just want to take a a bit of a step back just around that what is happening for people when a suicide occurs and and where the police are involved and where the coroner is involved and where the funeral director is involved. All these services are, are very experienced, unfortunately. In, in negotiating with individuals or families around what has happened when a suicide occurs. And so a lot of that kind of practicality, you know, the coroner can assist with a lot of that. The funeral director is certainly, you know, on the whole, excellent at supporting people through this really, really challenging time and supporting them to make decisions on, on you know, what they need to do. In regards to others who may come in, family members and friends, we often get that question around, what do I say to somebody who, who's bereaved by suicide? What do I say to somebody who's really hurting? I, I always say, look, you know, we, we all have different roles at different times. And the role of a friend or a family member is not to be a therapist, is to be a friend or a family member, which means sitting perhaps in silence, watching a movie together, having something to eat together, crying together, hugging each other, wherever it may be, it, it's not to 
concern oneself with, am I using the right language? It's really trying to communicate, I'm here for you. Whatever you need from me, you know, just let me know. And, and it's kind of, it's as complex and as simple as that, <laughs> I think often. You know, so what I would encourage anyone to do who has someone in their life who has lost someone to suicide is to, you know, just simply say, what do you need from me right now? And I'll be here for you when you need what you need. And also, you know, seek support for themselves if they need to as well. I mean, you know, there's some really good services, Suicide Line Victoria, Suicide Callback Service, you know, the counsellors there. They also support people uh, who have friends or family members who've lost someone to suicide around that very thing. You know, how do I, how do I talk to this person? What do I do? And generally it is, you know, that they be connected because the loss of someone to suicide, you can feel really alone in that, really disconnected. And you can have a lot of people around you, but it doesn't mean you're connected to them. And so, you know, just just you know, crying together, hugging together, being warm together, watching a movie together, eating together. It's, it's the simple day-to-day -day things that, that often people appreciate the most. I think one of the most important things that people need and, and will get from professional support and also hopefully friends and family is acceptance and understanding. So it's about patience and uh, kindness. Those simple things are actually very, very helpful. In terms of, say, a counselling situation, what people will get, again, there is certainly a, a sense of acceptance and understanding, but they'll learn some things about grief and about trauma and about suicide. Learning about those things helps people understand themselves because initially, as Sean said, the experience is so overwhelming. People will be feeling really out of their depth and quite ill-equipped to kind of deal with themselves. So the counselling can really help in understanding. So this is why I feel this way. This is why I'm thinking this way. This is why I'm behaving in this way. And people may well be feeling, thinking and doing things that they've never done before and never would have thought even possible that they would do. The other thing I think is that people can really explore the person's life. They can really talk a lot about the person who died, their life, what they knew of them. And it's an opportunity just to really speak about this person who they love but it's also in that process sometimes coming to a deeper understanding or a deeper awareness of how it might be that this person got to that point of taking their own life. We know a fair bit about suicide and what, what are the sort of risk factors and protective factors, but to really be able to deeply explore the story of this one person's life and what might have influenced them to get to that point, I think can also be really helpful. And that's the sort of thing where people might need to repeat and repeat certain aspects of their life and really kind of put together in a sense an understanding, a narrative, a bit of a story of how come this person might have ended their own life. And while we might never get the full picture, people can build up a deeper sense of understanding, which is also helpful, I think, to people um, who are bereaved by suicide. And also working through the trauma, if people are having particularly persistent or difficult traumatic symptoms. We can assist people to be dealing with those, to deal with the trauma and to also deal with the effects of the trauma. And then there's the group support, which is just incredibly powerful and very supportive. People can be in a room with others who have gone through this experience. And that sense of belonging, sense of everyone in this room understands me, is incredibly powerful in terms of restoring a sense of belonging because many people, perhaps not everyone, but many people after losing someone to suicide kind of feel, well, I guess can feel stigmatised. They can feel different. They can feel like people maybe look at them differently or are judgmental about them or judgmental about the person who died. 
And to be in a room with others really restores that sense of belonging and restores a sense of community, which is very helpful, deeply helpful. You've both mentioned the word community a number of times about how community is so important in helping people through this process and through this grieving process. How is that, yeah, community support helpful for people going through the grieving process? Suicide may feel, of course, when it happens to be a very personal individual thing, but actually it's a whole society issue. And and communities have a responsibility, I think, in regards to prevention of suicide and also support when a suicide has occurred. The way that can happen is that can be facilitated. So again, through education, through workshops, uh, through local services, just getting together. There there are within Victoria what we call postvention protocols. So some regions have a systemic approach to when a suicide has occurred and and we'll call in lots and lots of different services to see who can offer the best support. But also I think that the very fact that your local hairdresser, your sporting clubs, your shopkeepers, your neighbours come together strengthens the community because there's a common purpose there, there's a common sense of we need to take care of each other. And it's probably an unfortunate thing, but maybe the eradication of suicide isn't possible. But certainly the the support after suicide can be strengthened and can be kind of become a part of a kind of community response, you know, so so the shock is still there, the horror is still there, the trauma is still there. Suicide is so isolating, it's so disconnecting, it makes people feel so alone that the more people are around supporting each other, and especially if they're from the same community, then the stronger that community becomes, I think. For your average person at the sporting club or down the street or whatever, what are some of the things that we could be doing after somebody has died by suicide? Because I think there's a lot of us who sort of sit there and go, oh, well, I don't know what to say or I don't know what to do or, you know, it seems so far out of our own experience that how could we possibly be of any help? One of the things that happens for people is that they feel fearful of saying the wrong thing. They might feel fearful of suicide. It feels so horrific and so hard to understand that people kind of want to take a step back from it. That's why, as Sean said, the sense of isolation, sense of being kind of stigmatised, that's one of the reasons why it happens, I think, is that people feel afraid. It is horrific and it's hard to understand. I think it's something which I've kind of touched on already, which is it's about sensitivity, compassion, kindness, generosity. And then it's making a response. It's reaching out. It's offering support. It's sending a card, sending flowers, making contact. And also it's having an understanding that grief and trauma are quite debilitating. So people may not be able to think clearly They might be exhausted and probably, well, very likely, will not have much energy. So when those around a family or a person reach out, they might not get a response. But it's good to really understand that someone is exhausted and depleted really in in kind of energy. So it's to keep on reaching out. It's to deeply understand that some people won't have it in them sometimes. But so it's keeping up the contact. Sometimes I think it's also, it's not just offering support, it's actually providing support. So sometimes if you say to someone, I'm very willing to do, you just let me know what it is that you need. Some people won't be able to make a response to that. So it's good if people around can take a look and think, hmm, maybe cooking some food, but maybe mowing the lawn, doing some childminding, actually anticipating what would actually be helpful to someone, I think is good. And to keep up the contact, to understand also that people might say, no, they don't want to do this, they can't do that. And to really understand that that makes sense. It's normal for people in that level of grief and trauma 
to not have the energy to do things that they were able to do before. So again, having patience with that and then trying to fit in with what the bereaved person might have the capacity for rather than what they did before. To understand in a sense that the person before for a little while, if not a long while at least, is is kind of gone and their world has been reshaped immeasurably and so things will be different now and the ways of being together will be different probably for quite a long time. So it's a matter of that sensitivity and fitting in with what they might need rather than trying to keep things the same. Sean, I'll come back to you because I think one one last question that our listeners might have is that this this podcast is going to end up sitting on a, a website that's all about suicide prevention. Mm-hmm. And here we are talking about bereavement. Now, that doesn't necessarily follow, I guess, in a lot of people's minds, but what can you tell me about the role of caring for people who are bereaved in, in suicide prevention? Yeah, look, I mean, unfortunately, statistically, we do know that for those who've experienced a suicide loss, it actually increases their risk of suicide as well. And so supporting people who have lost someone to suicide is actually safeguarding them too. It's a preventative measure. Also, just awareness raising as well. So the more we talk about postvention, actually people are hearing more about suicide. And, and that in itself then leads to, okay, well, this sounds awful. <laughs> you know, we, we don't want to, to be in these postvention spaces. We don't want to be supporting people after suicide. So what, what can motivate us and drive us then to look at preventing this happening again? And, and the learnings from when a suicide has occurred, you know, can also contribute to that too. So what was happening for this individual, as Louise was saying, that might come out over a long period of time and may never <laughs> entirely be known. But, but you know, there may be things in there that, that we think, okay, if that had been in place, perhaps that, that could have been a protective factor as well. Mm-hmm. So, you know, postvention is very, 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 very critically linked to prevention as well. And, and uh, I think postvention is, is kind of uh, not a new concept. It's always been around. But, but the idea of that more holistic approach, you know, so we talk about prevention, we talk about intervention, and we've talked about that for, for many, many years. And now, you know, we're recognising that postvention actually plays a really significant part in in everything to do around suicide as well. And the other aspect of that is that what we know from literature and research, but also from our contact with people, is that there is a higher incidence of some mental health issues. For instance, anxiety and depression and post-traumatic stress disorder with people who are bereaved. The other impact that we can see over the longer term is a reduced sort of engagement in life and community. So social activities, employment, education, some people will withdraw from that engagement. What the support and care of bereaved people offers is addressing the risk of suicide, the potential mental health outcomes, but also that engagement in in life. We're making it more possible for people to actually speak about suicide. So it becomes less fearsome, uh, less taboo. And I think if we can speak about it and acknowledge it, then we become less afraid of it and we become more able to deal with it. And I think that that's something that we do see in, in both programs. We see individuals, families and communities becoming less afraid, more able to respond and it's community strengthening and I think community empowering when when we're able to do this and uh, communities become healthier. That's a very important suicide prevention activity. If you could sort of snap your fingers and change one thing about the community that would make your job in in suicide prevention and suicide bereavement easier, what would you change about the community to sort of make this space work a little bit more effectively? For me, it is 
let's get rid of stigma, let's get rid of this fear around suicide and, and conversations around suicide, because it, it, it's a hiddenness of it. And, and look, it's understandable. We, we get where all this comes from, because we're talking about, you know, we're life-sustaining individuals, and, and when something occurs that takes that life away, we don't know what to do with that often. And, and when that is self-taken away by ourselves, another layer on top of that. And, and so it's a life question. And, and so if the stigma is preventing conversations, if that taboo and that hiddenness is, is preventing conversations, what it also prevents is people reaching out for support and others kind of recognising where that support may come from too. Yes, and I think one of the ways which we have touched on already is by being informed, doing the best we can to understand, but to be informed, to to have more uh, confidence in talking about these things and to know that we can and that it's a good idea to be talking about these things, I think is very helpful. For more information about the programs that Sean and Louise have mentioned, visit standbysupport.com.au or supportaftersuicide.org.au. Or you can access support by calling 1300 747 247. Both Standby and Support After Suicide are available for people living in Gippsland. If any of the topics in this interview have affected you in any way, support is available via Lifeline on 13 11 14. For more interviews, check out the Gippsland PHN website.